Welcome to the Arecibo Future Talk series. The Arecibo Science Advocacy Partnership is honored today to host Dale Ferguson. He is the lead for the Space Charging Science and Technology with the Space Vehicle Division at the Air Force Research Laboratory. He is author of more than 300 publications and his contribution has been recognized with multiple awards like the 2020 Stellar Award for his space achievements. Dale has been a friend and an SEO user. And perhaps you are going to be surprised to know that he started his career at Arecibo. From 1978 to 1981, Dale was a Pulsar staff member. However, since 1982, he left Arecibo and he was addressing space charging problems. But he knows Arecibo very well. He knows the radio telescope capabilities and is aware of the possibilities that such a big dish could create for small instruments. Then in 2018-2019, he spent six months at the observatory developing and deploying an instrument to measure space charging, known as the AFRL Dagger project. He installed a 327 megahertz antenna at the focal surface of the Arecibo dish. Normally the gain of such an antenna is small, but he knew that the 305 meter dish could increase the antenna's gain and then it would be possible to measure satellite or spacecraft charging from the ground. That was the beginning of the Dagger program that was collecting data until the Arecibo collapsed. Since then, Dale has been advocating for a prompt repair of the Arecibo radio telescope, using the remaining capabilities like the ISR and the HF antennas. He's here today to present his ideas. Please let us welcome Dale. Eliana, my computer froze up, so can you hear me? I can hear you, and the presentation okay, is good. up. I can, I can now see you as well, but OK. Can you see the presentation? Good. All right, then I'll get started. Um, this is uh, the content of this talk is a uh, paper that uh, I and the other authors you see here presented to uh, the Journal of Astronomical Instrumentation last year. Uh, and it's finally been accepted for publication. Well, we published soon, I hope we've already checked the proofs. Uh, so anyway, it's a, a preliminary plan to quickly restore some capability to the Arecibo 305 meter telescope. I, I wanna thank all the people who are listed there uh, as co-authors because they did contribute significantly to the work that I'm presenting. Uh, at the end, we'll have some more acknowledgements of people who have, uh, who have helped uh, bring this paper along. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, I think uh, you probably all know the capabilities that of the Arecibo telescope. Uh, this in this talk, I'm only going to talk about restoring four uh, possible um, capabilities, uh, ionospheric experiments using HF heaters, 430 megahertz incoherent scatter radar, satellite arc observations, and pulsar astronomy and other astronomy at frequencies less than 500 megahertz. Uh, as you know, all of these were terminated when uh, cable breaks destroyed the telescope on December 1st, 2020. Uh, so uh, in, anyway, this is basically a proposal uh, to show that by we can restore the Arecibo dish for low frequency operation uh, and uh, uh, at least restore some of these capabilities. Now, you'll notice uh, by its absence, planetary radar here. Uh, 
and I'll talk about it later if I have time, why it is that I have not included that here. Although there are uh, possible plans to use the dish uh, for doing that again, uh, using uh, cranes or whatever to support the feeds. So let's go on to the next uh, slide. Uh, in order to restore any of these capabilities, we're gonna to have to partially restore the 305 meter dish. Uh, hopefully we can replace the uh, north, south and east, west main cables and restore the dish shape uh, and then put in uh, panels or uh, wire mesh to fill in uh, uh, the gaps that exist there now. Uh, uh, if, uh, if we're only going to use the telescope for HF, then uh, we, we could uh, only, we could fill these in with just coarse wire mesh. But uh, if we want to do radio astronomy or ISR, we're going to have to have a better dish uh, than that mesh, the original mesh. And so we need to have a, a better surface, which could either be through new panels or some kind of mesh that's really fine. So it will reflect 500 megahertz, up to 500 megahertz very well. <coughs> I may be uh, one of the few people here today who can remember the original system uh, uh, that was basically, people call it chicken wire. Uh, it could operate well, even up to 500 megahertz. Uh, so uh, if we want to do something that is uh, radio astronomy like, uh, we need to to have a better um, uh, mesh than what could fill in uh, for the gaps right now uh, with, uh, you know, like chicken wire or whatever. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, as you all know, the uh, tops of the towers were sheared off and they, and they collapsed. And uh, so part of this, in order to be able to, to support feeds for the telescope, part of this and uh, mesh uh, reflectors, we uh, will need to miss, uh, replace the missing tops of the towers with freestanding communications towers. These don't have to be solid towers. They can be just like uh, amateur radio, or I should say radio stations use uh, to support their uh, antennas. Uh, but on top of these new tower segments would be cable guides for three lightweight cable systems. First, uh, cables to support a Cassegrain subreflector uh, for HF cables to support a lightweight Gregorian for reflector for 430 megahertz ISR, and then a football cam-like optical fiber cables to support and position a broadband feed for passive observation. So like, next slide, please. In addition, uh, for HF heating, we're, we should uh, replace the dipole antennas with new optimized broadband dipoles. Uh, Jim Brakehall uh, has a couple of those designs and I'll talk about them later. One of them is shown in, in uh, paper by Paul Bernhardt in 2021. We also need new balance. Uh, 
new uh, HF power coax and auxiliary equipment to go with HF heating. For the 430 megahertz ISR, which is envisioned in this proposal as just being something that would look straight up, uh, we need to have refurbished klystrons and support equipment. All of this stuff would be put under the dish center and that's where we would have the new uh, feed for 430. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. For passive satellite observation and radio astronomy, we're going to need uh, break all type uh, broadband feeds or some other kind for Skycam like operation. We're going to need LNAs, uh, digitizers, optical fiber connections. Uh, a real-time kinematic uh, GPS system for positioning the feed and a computer system to position and point the feed. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the SkyCam system later. Next slide, please. Okay, on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the uh, VSWR for uh, a new break all design uh, broadband feed for uh, HF. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see, it's uh, more broadband than, than the old feeds, uh, has a VSWR less than 1.5 for uh, an entire megahertz. So we can tune this thing around uh, and uh, examine uh, behavior of the ionosphere with uh, different uh, uh, different frequencies. The design uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but or I've misrepresented what you what you've done. But on the left hand side, bottom is a 3D view of uh, HF transmission dipoles. Each one would actually have three. Uh, elements instead of one. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's one design. Another possibility is a cross dipole a design like uh, we used in uh, 2019 for 327 megahertz. Only if this of course would be scaled up for uh, much uh, larger uh, wavelengths. Uh, let's look at the next slide. This is this was my baby that I put on there and had put on in 2019. This is a break all design of a wide band, 50 megahertz, 327 megahertz uh, Arecibo point feed, and uh, this was supported uh, above the 305 meter dish uh, and enabled us to uh, to see. Um, satellites in the real geo belt uh, for uh, arcing observations. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, now I'm going to talk about just the HF system for a little bit. Uh, uh, as, as you all know, the HF system needs a sub-reflector uh, and uh, one of a new design could be supported on cables from reels on top of the new tower extensions. The uh, uh, Bernhardt paper in 2021 uh, showed uh, some uh, beam patterns uh, in addition to the uh, new reflector. Uh, and you can see that by changing the uh, phases of the different uh, different feeds, you can get a different antenna pattern. Uh, and so this would be very uh, useful. Possibly, uh, as you can see in the lower right there, there might be a configuration 
that would allow us to stabilize the excited ionospheric layers in altitude. As you as you know, now they are uh, they they tend to move, uh, and so uh, it's it's hard to uh, prevent uh, looking at many different ionospheric layers at the same time, or I should say, exciting them. So anyway, there's a possibility with this new uh, design to uh, uh, have different beam patterns, uh, something that was not capable, the old system wasn't capable of doing. Okay, next slide, please. And even by tilting the mesh, you can change the beam pattern so that uh, you can actually steer the beam somewhat. This is uh, taken out of uh, Bernhardt's paper. Uh, and I believe this was for a 10 degree uh, tilt of the mesh. And uh, you can see that now the beam is uh, not looking straight up. It's, it's going off to the side a bit. So anyway, uh, this is a, is a possible way of doing the uh, HF heating that has been so much a part of Arecibo's history from the beginning. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, of course, changing the ionosphere doesn't do you much good if uh, you can't see what you've done. And that's the purpose of the 430 megahertz ions, uh, incoherent scatter radar. Uh, this uh, picture on the right of this slide is from uh, Felix Fernandez, who showed that uh, a uh, 430 megahertz system could, uh, by being fed from underneath the center of uh, the main dish, could uh, use an ISR subreflector uh, of a Gregorian design, which would be supported then by cables above the Cassegrain subreflector mesh for HF and would allow you to do uh, ISR uh, at the same time, basically, as, as the, uh, you're heating the ionosphere with the HF. Uh, so, uh, and by making the one system Gregorian and the other Cassegrain, you uh, won't have any interference between the two meshes ever because uh, in a uh, Gregorian system, uh, your uh, subreflector is always above the focal point of the main dish. And for a Cassegrain, uh, you're always below, so the mesh, the meshes will not interfere with each other. They can both be supported, however, by cables from the same uh, towers. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, if we're going to do 430 megahertz without having a platform, we have to have uh, the the feed in the center of the dish uh, in, a, in a more or less stationary position. Uh, we can uh, use the same kind of waveguide from the control room down to, uh, down to the feed in the center of the dish, uh, same kind of waveguide that was used before for the 430 system. Uh, but now, of course, we're, we're uh, transmitting down uh, the, the 430 signal down to uh, the feed at, at the center of the dish. We probably need to have a small house uh, down underneath the center of the dish uh, with a transparent RF opening in the ceiling so that we can uh, transmit from down there uh, uh, 
transmit and receive uh, from down below the, the uh, center of the dish. Uh, so let's look at the next slide, please. This uh, is from Felix Fernandez. This is a, a, a picture, picture of what such a feed underneath the center of the dish might look like. And uh, the uh, calculated uh, beam pattern from such a system. Uh, it's possible uh, that one could actually beam steer the beam a little bit by tilting the, the mesh. Uh, this uh, idea of tilting the mesh is one that we could not implement in the old uh, telescope design uh, because of all the cables and so on that were uh, interfering with the uh, possibility of doing this. But uh, if, we, if we've dispensed with the platform which is the proposal that we're putting forward today, uh, that would be possible that we could actually tilt uh, re the reflecting meshes just by pulling on, the, on one cable or another uh, that uh, support the, the mesh. So let's look at uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is the far field antenna pattern calculated for the proposed dual reflector 430 megahertz ISR on the left. And, and you can see the false color uh, picture of the far field antenna pattern on the right. Uh, it's not ideal, but uh, it would be a good, uh, a good uh, ISR system, we believe. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, SkyCam-like system support for supporting broadband point feeds over the dish. Uh, I don't know how many of you, of you are familiar with this system, but it's used to broadcast above the field video camera footage during sporting events. Uh, what they do is they support a video camera from Kevlar cables and they have central optical fibers uh, where they can send and receive signals uh, to the camera through the cables themselves. And then they can move the uh, feed around or I should say in this case, the camera around by um, re reeling in or unreeling the cables that support the, the camera. Uh, for most for sporting events uh, like uh, football games and baseball games and so on, uh, four reels are, are, being, are used now in this uh, SkyCam system. Uh, but a three reel system could be used, uh, supported from the three, uh, the three towers as they're uh, rebuilt. Okay, now this is a system that's similar to the feed positioning system used on the Chinese FAST FAST telescope uh, in China. Uh, the uh, the difference is there they have, uh, I believe it's six different towers uh, and they support uh, their feed above the dish in that way. Uh, at Arecibo, what we would do is we would replace the video camera by a, a broadband feed. It could be a break all feed or some other type of extremely broadband feed that would uh, give you signals up to 500 uh, megahertz 
and uh, and you'd support the LNAs and power supplies and filters and whatever else you need, post post amplifiers, uh, variable step attenuators, and so on. Uh, they would ride along with the feed that you're supporting. Uh, these things are all lightweight components, and so they wouldn't add appreciably to the uh, mass or weight of the feed. So let's go on to the next slide. This is my uh, uh, visual, uh, notional idea of uh, how the break-all feed could be supported by a SkyCam type suspension. You can see the cables there. Uh, in this case, it would be a four cable system, but you can see the cables there supporting uh, the, uh, the feed. And one would then move the speed around above the dish uh, and point it at the right spot so that you could po essentially point the telescope uh, wherever you wanted it. Uh, of course, pointing it off the dish doesn't help you much. Uh, so even, even with this kind of a system, you'd uh, be restricted to uh, something like a 45 or 47 degree uh, zenith angle coverage of the telescope. But that's so much better than what we've, we've had in the past, which was 20 degrees from the zenith, that this would actually enable you to see a lot more objects in the sky. And you might even be able to uh, look at uh, the uh, galactic center uh, with one of these point feeds. Okay, uh, next slide, please. To show you that this is not just uh, smoke and mirrors, we actually did support the three, a broadband 327 megahertz feed on the 305 meter telescope in 2019. Uh, and here's the support it was supported by the old uh, uh, 430 megahertz line feed, or what was left of it after the hurricane. And uh, uh, this enabled us to actually be able to, to give a, get more, two degrees more of zenith angle coverage. And we actually saw some uh, geo belt satellites with this uh, and measured arcing on them. Uh, that was something that we, we, we just lacked two degrees of being able to do that with the old telescope uh, design. So uh, the other possibility uh, and, and uh, would be uh, beneficial for uh, uh, the Air Force, at least, is that uh, by by having this enlarged zenith angle coverage, we could actually see uh, satellites around uh, the moon. Uh, and, uh, and we'd have coverage of cis lunar space, which is uh, a worry for the Air Force because of the Chinese. Uh, the, the Chinese want to put satellites there, and we don't know whether they're friend or foe. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, just to kind of refresh your memory, wideband point feeds have been commonly used at, at Arecibo for, for many, many years. I, I can remember back in, I think it was 1981, uh, using a point feed uh, to do uh, simultaneous uh, measurements of pulsars at two different frequencies. Uh, John Matthews used the point feed at 430 megahertz in 2004. And of course, we've already talked about how in 2019 we used this broadband break all point feed uh, at 327 megahertz. 
this actually gave measured performance, as you can see there. Uh, Phil Perilat was good enough to, uh, to measure this performance and the gain was only down by, from the Gregorian system to, by about uh, 2.65 dB, which I think is really kind of amazing. Uh, uh, theoretically, uh, it, it should be down by only two and a half dB, but you know, there, there you go. That's a real system it was 2.65. Uh, and uh, so, of course, what this what this does it means is that uh, a point feed at least at 327 is uh, illuminates uh, less of a dish less of a dish than we were we were used to. Instead of 205 uh, meter diameter illumina illuminated. Uh, it's down to about 150 meters. That's still pretty good and better than uh, any other single dish uh, except for the Chinese dish uh, in, in terms of uh, illuminated diameter. Uh, of course, at, if you're pointing this thing at the edge of the dish, performance would be further degrade and, and, and uh, perhaps another 3 dB down, which still gives you a, a, an effective illuminated dish diameter of about 100 meters. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. So uh, we've already talked about these uh, Kevlar fiber cables that uh, support the SkyCam system. Uh, they're rated at 600 pounds braking strength, and we're not going to be anywhere near that with a feed that we're supporting above the dish. Uh, the nice thing about the SkyCam system is that uh, in a sporting event, it can track a running athlete uh, or a moving vehicle that speeds up to 30 miles per hour. That's how they can follow the football player down the field uh, or the football in midair. Uh, and uh, so at Arecibo, what, not only would this allow us to, to track, uh, you know, satellites in MEO and GEO, but also we could even track LEO satellites across the sky uh, with this, uh, this kind of system. Uh, the rest of what's on this slide is really just to convince you, if you needed convincing, that we can support the weight of the feed, uh, even with all the supporting equipment needed uh, uh, easily with these SkyCam cables. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, now, in a sporting event and with a camera, uh, the sky cam is positioned by a steerer person who uh, is watching the video feed uh, and can steer the, the uh, and move the camera so that it can follow the action. Uh, but it's also uh, the sky cam is pointed in the right direction while moving by another pointer person on another computer. Uh, this is a complex system, but it seems to work well for sporting events. And in sporting events, they have a keep out zone that keeps the uh, camera from inadvertently crashing into the sky, into the ground, or into the participants on the field. Uh, and we, um, uh, at Arecibo, we would want to have a keep out zone to keep the, the uh, feed on the paraxial surface of the, of the telescope dish so that uh, we would always be in position. Uh, if we were not, the telescope wouldn't work. So uh, 
for Arecibo, we we would need to point position and point uh, the feed necessarily by the same computer and by computer only, uh, uh, because the video feed, of course, would be replaced by a, uh, a radio feed. Uh, and uh, if wind loading would be a problem, we could put small holes in the back plane of the of the feed uh, without losing any performance. Now I talked with this uh, technical director of Skycam named Stephen Wharton back in 2021, and he said yes, he can or we can operate from less than four flight positions. Uh, flight position is is considered a what we would say is the end of the, the, the cable. Yes, we can automate, can automate, automate control positioning of a payload. Uh, he was concerned about using the SkyCam system as is because it would have a, uh, have to have something like 750 feet of line out. Uh, and they're used to more about half that size, that span, but uh, the Chinese fast system uses longer cables, and it's believed that uh, a SkyCam-like system could could uh, use uh, longer cables as well without any loss of system performance. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, now where do we know, how do we know where the feed is? We have to have a GPS receiver on the feed that will allow us to position it and, and from where it's positioned, we can point it. Okay, now GPS receivers, especially the kind that we would need, can allow positioning to a, within two centimeters every tenth of a second, which uh, which is probably better than the position feed positioning that we had on the telescope before. Uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, receiver, GPS receiver, weighs less than a kilogram and so wouldn't appreciably add to the weight of the of the feed system. Uh, so pointing and, and, tra and uh, tracking would be done by computer. Uh, pointing can be accurate to within a fraction of a degree. Uh, and the, such a system is used routinely in uh, uh, earth sciences. Uh, they could, you know, see uh, motion of, of our plates, tectonic plates, with these things and so on. Uh, of course, we would we would need a little better time resolution than that, but still, every tenth of a second is probably good enough. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, now what I've what I've neglected to talk about yet is replacing the tops of the towers with these uh, uh, freestanding communications towers. Uh, I, I've looked this up. They are commercially available uh, in, in both those sizes. Uh, even low cost towers can withstand 90 mile per hour winds, but if we want to uh, kind of overdo the that a weight carrying capability of these things because we're going to have three different cable systems running from the top. Uh, we could use a sturdier tower design, would cost a little bit more, but still uh, it's, it's entirely feasible to put these power, towers on top of the existing piece of towers that still are there. Uh, so the system would be operated would operate in two different modes. 
as the, as the system was uh, in the pre, uh, previously at Arecibo, we'd, we'd have a system with a HF or uh, an ISR instrument and then uh, lower the mesh and so on down uh, and uh, operate the SkyCam uh, feed operation. Uh, so uh, all of this can be done by lowering uh, the stow position uh, or uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, the radio, uh, uh, radio feeds, uh, uh, we might be able to get by with uh, just one type of feed and wouldn't have to change out the uh, the feed if we have a if we have a wide enough bandwidth system. Okay, uh, if we're only going to do HF, then we wouldn't even require extra towers on top of the existing towers. We could support the uh, sub reflector from uh, the existing uh, tower tops. Okay, next please. And this is a cartoon. I apologize, I did this on my own computer. Uh, cartoon of a break all type feed supported from uh, three rebuilt Arecibo tower tops. Uh, it, uh, so this, this notional picture where everything has been exaggerated in size and thickness and so on uh, is kind of what I envision the uh, radio astronomy uh, type uh, system to look like. Uh, okay, now I was unable to put any, any uh, cost of the design into the paper that is going to go into the Journal of Astronomical Instrumentation because the Air Force says that that would be lobbying Congress uh, to put in actual numbers of, of uh, you know, costs and so on. So they've been left out of here uh, but I think what we're looking at is uh, a few million dollars for the whole system, uh, probably less than 10, 10 million dollars for the whole system. And it could probably be built in a matter of uh, three to five years. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. This is really just to acknowledge uh, people who've helped with this, with this concept, uh, especially want to point out somebody that you you are not familiar with. Uh, uh, my old high school friend Roger Dunn is uh, now doing uh, sky cab uh, work for uh, football games all over the country, all over the U.S. Uh, and. Uh, so I got a lot of the details about SkyCam systems from him. Uh, he's well known for having done this. And then of course, uh, these other names you're probably more familiar with. And I wanna thank also the entire uh, ASAP uh, group because uh, they've helped so much with uh, making this a better paper. Also, a couple of anonymous referees. One of them I uh, did battle with for over six months before getting him to agree that this is possibly a feasible concept. So, uh, okay, let's take a look at the next slide. And uh, here's uh, the references. Uh, I don't expect you to uh, to read them now, but uh, 
there are references for most of the material that I gave presented today. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, tell everybody that you know uh, about this possible way of, of uh, rebuilding uh, Arecibo uh, quickly. Oh, I wanted to say about uh, uh, the uh, planetary radar. It would be possible, I believe, to support uh, all the necessary equipment for doing uh, 2380 uh, megahertz radar uh, uh, by a crane that would be supported over the dish. Uh, uh, Mike Nolan might uh, comment on that after uh, after the, this talk is over, but uh, I, I didn't feel like uh, the uh, the idea was so was far enough along that we could actually talk about it in this paper or in this talk. Uh, maybe it was something we can talk about later. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dale, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it would be really nice if we can expand that. And, and if someone has questions, please let us know. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here. And okay. I can see that uh, they have been asking in the chat that if we can maybe post uh, a link for the paper. Is it out yet? Sure. Sure. Uh, well, the paper is not published yet, but uh, I don't think there's any problem with with uh, sending a draft out. So I'll give you, you can just uh, ask for it at my, uh, you've frozen up again. Are you okay? Okay. We are listening. Uh, you can ask for it at my, uh, at my address uh, here at the Air Force. Uh, it's dale.ferguson.1 at spaceforce.mil. And I will be glad to send you uh, the latest copy. Thank you, Dale. Are there questions? I see a hand rise. A W1YW ship. You can, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Dale, thanks a lot. I, I, I hope everyone fully appreciates the thousands of hours that everyone put into to making this design and, and bringing it forward. Uh, I, I think from a political standpoint, once it goes to the next step, you can't underemphasize the fact that you're leveraging uh, the resources that are already there and building upon it in the most cost-effective way. And um, that's basically what the politicians are going to try to understand. They're going to assume that the design has already been vetted by the scientists and, and uh, probably will not put a lot of input into it. The other point I wanted to make is uh, extending the, uh, the coverage to uh, a greater declination range really opens up some huge opportunities for leveraging the dish for VHF and UHF VLBI in the future. And uh, it, it really looks like that's, that's a frontier that uh, was important many years ago and is probably likely to be more important moving ahead in the future. So that's an exciting capability that, that shouldn't be underestimated. And that's all I have, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh... I can remember Ken Turner back in back in my 1978 to 81 days. Ken Turner doing uh, VLBI with the with the telescope then, and so I know that's an important capability. If we can get that back, it would be really uh, really great. Anish. Uh Thanks, Dan, for the great presentation. And I also think that this is the 
uh, way to move forward in short term. Um, uh, I, I have a question related with the uh, uh, use of Skycam versus uh, the crane. The advantage I see in crane is that one could also put uh, uh, line fields uh, and even faced line fields so that you could uh, recover a part of the uh, loss in the gain of the telescope. So uh, uh, one uh, problem which I could immediately see is that probably the crane will have less sky coverage compared to the sky cam. Is that uh, my understanding right? correct? Uh, I, I don't know because I don't know what the design is for, this, for the crane. But uh, I, I agree with you that uh, the crane would give you more capability for uh, carrying weight. Uh, now the the uh, and and also uh, you could use line feeds. What I wanted to show was that you don't lose that much, even with point feeds, at least at these low frequencies. Uh, you you only lose say you know possibly three dB. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's a lot of people are willing to, would be willing to put up with that. Uh, the other problem with using a crane is I don't think it would move as, be able to move as fast. And so some of the things like I was talking about uh, 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 following uh, LEO satellites or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, something that requires you to move the, the feed uh, quickly might not be so easily accommodated with a crane. I don't know. But as I say, I don't know what the crane design would be even. Uh, I know there are cranes that, are, that would be large enough or tall enough and carry enough weight for this because um, Elon Musk is using them for building his SpaceX rockets. But uh, uh, I don't know their capabilities. I don't know what their design is. I don't know how we could use them. Okay, there Thanks, are a couple Dick. of questions uh, on the chat. This is from NCH Wright. Nice presentation, thanks. This looks like a viable way to restore and enhance some of the unique capabilities of Arecibo at low cost and in an attractive time scale. Well done. This is from Dana. What about cryogenics from the LNAs uh, for pass passive radio astronomy? Also, is there a diagram showing ray traces for the optical, various optical spot configurations, both at the center of the field and at extreme edges? Um, I'm going to have to defer to Jim Brakehall uh, for this because I didn't do that design. I don't know exactly. And I didn't certainly didn't do the computations. So uh, maybe Felix Fernandez. Uh, Felix, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Oh, OK. Maybe you could comment on. Uh, uh, the we, question that yeah, was we, asked. This was a very crude design, a very simple, you know, quick design using just geometric optics. It's an axisymmetric design, so it doesn't point anywhere other than straight up. It's not the, the best solution, right? Uh, the best solution would include another reflector, and much like we did in the Gregorian, uh, in the original legacy design. So, so we don't have that. We didn't go into that depth for this paper. And I'm sure we have we would do that if we do get the green light to you know design it properly. Yeah. I I could also make some comments. I think Dana's question was uh, also for the Skycam system, I believe. And so since it's a point feed, yes, we haven't studied how that's gonna uh, work, but we, we do know that it, it worked really good for uh, Dell's uh, experiments with the satellites. And I should mention, I, I do have a PhD student 
actually be my last PhD student since <laughs> I'm thinking of retiring in December. And, uh, but I still will be doing all kinds of projects for the future. But uh, he's actually taken Felix's design and doing some more analysis and, and so forth on that. So, and we have been uh, doing some ray tracing and, and so forth on that. Maybe so many people involved in this project. Thank you so much for everyone, to Jim, to Felix, and, and so on. Yeah, it was, it was really great talking to you all and getting your input on this. I would have never been able to have done it myself. I should mention that uh, there has been ongoing work with some funds that have been available over the past uh, uh, year here or so. Uh, Felix could comment. I did, I guess I don't see Cristiano on, but he could comment more. But uh, there has been work on the HF system and getting uh, three dipoles at five megahertz are, are back. And I think they're intact. Uh, there is work on getting the transmission lines that were damaged. There wasn't much damage to the transmission lines, getting those connected to those five megahertz dipoles. And uh, I've been working uh, to get a company connected up with the observatory. And I think they finally got some agreements signed and so forth. And it's called Antenna Products Corporation out of Texas. And uh, Antenna Products is the company that did the mesh up at HARP for the ground screen. And that's a very large mesh, very similar. And so uh, they are uh, hopefully uh, with some more funding and proposals going to be able to build the mesh and make it really a good design, much like the, the mesh that was done at HARP. So, uh, and of course, as you know, the, the transmitter building is intact. There was no damage to that. The power supply generation turbines uh, are intact. And so the HF could come up uh, uh, pretty soon, we think, if we can uh, get the, 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 the biggest thing is the mesh, you know, to get that mesh. And of course, the, the prime reflector, as Dal mentioned, at the minimum, we could put very big openings and, and bring the HF uh, main dish up, but it, it would certainly be fruitful to have much smaller openings and be able to do something like the SkyCam and the ISR with the Gregorian hung up there and, and so forth. So there is stuff going on that you maybe don't know that it's happening, but it, it is still happening in, in the background. Oh, uh, th thank you, Jim. By, by the way, this uh, tech, uh, technical director at SkyCam, uh, he told me that his father had worked at Arecibo back in the uh, uh, late 60s, early, early 70s. And I think that's where he got his antenna expertise. But anyway, uh, you know, Arecibo is uh, part of everybody's lives. I agree with that. <laughs> there are more questions on, on the chat. Luca Olmi is asking, will this be a temporary or permanent installation? Will future solutions require to dismantle it? Uh, I don't know because I don't know what the future is gonna hold. Uh, I know there have been designs uh, for uh, uh, for uh, even a uh, phased array using the Arecibo dish as a as the central main element. Uh, I don't know how far along those designs are. This would mean building lots of other smaller dishes around uh, or uh, antennas. Uh, I don't know uh, anything about that. Uh, Anish, do you know uh, any details about such plans? Uh, not really, sorry. Okay. So anyway, I, I don't know whether this could be uh, made permanent or whether we'd want to make it permanent, but it's something that would, you know, keep us from having to sit around twiddling our thumbs for a, a decade or more 
until the new Arecibo is built? Uh, I guess that was the answer also for Tiger Du. He's asking about like the long-term repair, how this is affecting the long-term repair. Uh, Robert Kerr is asking, are there funds identified for a long-term repair to close that bridge if you come to it? I don't know who can answer this. Um, I, don't know. Uh, I think the NSF has, has uh, so far not uh, responded to uh, those requests. So uh -huh. uh, that's all I can say. I'm not gonna get into trouble with NSF, I hope, uh, because we need their help, but uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, the Air Perhaps. Force's position, the Air Perhaps. Force's position is uh, such that uh, the Air Force position right now is that we are not going to get into building new facilities like we did with HARP because uh, uh, that's not our job. But I think uh, if if uh, somebody like NSF chipped in uh, a, a good a good amount, the Air Force could be talked into helping helping out with this too. Sean, I see someone's got his hand up. Sean, can you talk? Yeah, just uh, we what Dale said is correct. We are still waiting to hear from the NSF on what they want to do with us. So no new updates there. I mean, I want to see a, a rebuilt facility as much as anybody else, uh, especially, and this was missing from, you know, what I talked about today, especially planetary radar. That is something that the Air Force is really interested, interested in because we have this interest in planetary protection, uh, as NASA does. Uh, but also, uh, the Air Force is interested in possibly using planetary radar uh, in cislunar space uh, to uh, to look at, uh, you know, uh, satellites around the moon. So, hopefully, NSF will respond. I don't know if Hector or someone from the advocacy group can comment about the funding efforts that we have been doing. Is there, is Hector there? I'm here, yes, but uh, I, there's nothing to report on that. I mean, we uh, continue uh, ASAP, the uh, um, our civil science advocacy partnership continues to advocate uh, with Congress for more funding for the Arecibo Observatory, but um, uh, we've gotten some support in words, as you probably heard of, uh, uh, gotten support in terms of uh, Senate resolution, which passed unanimously back in February, <clears throat> um, which is, you know, um, recognized the importance of the Arecibo Observatory and also encouraged NSF, NASA, and other uh, federal agencies to look for ways into um, uh, uh, build another um, facility that would be as good or better than the, what was there before. But besides that, we haven't, uh, or they haven't said anything, but we continue. And so if you want to help, uh, you're more than welcome to join our uh, focusing campaign. I don't know if that answers your question, Aliana, but. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Mm. Jimmy is putting in the chat, don't forget that there is still world-class optical facilities intact on Culebra and I guess on the side, as well as the HF and the 12 meter dish. Yes, it's still work at Arecibo, there's still some research going on. And I guess it's time to say goodbye. Thank you so much to everyone that attended this uh, talk. To Dale, it was great to hear these options and, and it's a new possibility for Arecibo. We keep praying for the Arecibo future. Thank you so much.
And I hope we hope Thank we can you. see you in the next events. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye Thank bye. You. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Aliana. And thanks, everybody. And Dale, especially.